Hi guys, it's another cold, wet, miserable night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this nasty Tuesday night, December 6, 2022. And uh, so guys, it has finally happened uh, after much waiting and uh, drum rolling, I am finally, I'm just going to make a second chronicle of the collapse for December 6, 2022. You can pretty much have two chronicles of the collapse every day now from this point forward, but we are finally going to uh, go back over to medium.com and we're going to hear from a fellow that we have not heard from yet so far. I'm going to put the little dog back to bed. That was it. That wasn't too bad. Uh, we're going to hear from this fellow named Adam Wren. Adam W-R-E-N, like the bird. Adam has 511 followers, including me. And uh, a little bit about Adam. He has a master's degree in geopo geopolitics, territory, and security from King's College in London. I am much more concerned with what is going to happen rather than what should happen. So, according to Adam Wren's reading of the tea leaves, this is what he thinks the collapse will look like. What will the collapse look like? According to Adam, who has done his homework, this is a long involved story. As always, I'll put the link on here and you can read it yourself. <clears throat> There is a belief, particularly among young people, well, thank you, Adam, for thinking I'm a young person, <clears throat> that global warming, an increasingly hostile economy, resource shortages, and countless other crises are combining into a mega crisis that is going to cause a civilizational collapse within our lifetimes. For a moment, let's leave aside the discussion of whether this is the case and assume that it is. Let's assume that we are approaching the end. I think that is a perfectly rational assumption. <clears throat> like playing Jenga, young people will know what that means, like playing Jenga, we know that the tower will eventually fall over, but we can't say with certainty if it's going to be when we pull this particular block or the next. We can't predict the direction. We can't predict who is going to win. While attempting to remain as grounded and realistic as possible, I'm going to outline what collapse actually looks like and what it might mean for you. <clears throat> the phrase civilizational collapse evokes images of Mad Max, the Fallout games, Terminator, Dawn of the Dead, and so on. We imagine the collapse to be instantaneous, recognizable, and dramatic. Monday, you're relaxing with your family by the pool. Friday, you're grilling rat skewers over a flaming barrel in the ruins of your city, fending off would-be thieves with a machete. Is this realistic? With 100% certainty, yes. Also with 100% certainty, no. For that answer to make sense, let's step back for a moment and examine what civilization is. What we think of as civilization is really a super system. It's a massive, enormously complex systems system made up of other complex systems like the oceans, our interlinked national economies, stock markets, 
and global supply change, all of these systems interact with each other and together add up to our civilization. There you go. Short of a coronal mass ejection, a stray black hole passing through our solar system or other cosmically calamitous events, there aren't many things that could instantaneously demolish our global civilization. But he doesn't really talk about nuclear war in here, I noticed. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that things cannot get very rapidly worse before individuals are capable of reacting. All of our systems are interlinked and like our bodies being overwhelmed by an illness, a failure in one system can place immense pressure on connected systems that were previously fine. This means that the collapse that people imagine, the instantaneous, dramatic, Hollywood-style happening, is a certainty. It might kill you and your entire family, or you might not even notice. It depends on your position in the game board. If we assume that it is true that we are past peak everything, the most likely scenario for the coming decades is a slow reduction in the complexity of our systems. Population decline, production decline as we pay increased costs to access fewer and fewer resources, living standards across the globe drop, and more and more people are pushed into poverty and starvation. We can see this happening already. Severe food insecurity has been climbing steadily for the past six years reversing a decades-long trend. <clears throat> Global warming is already reducing crop yields. Global rice yields are dropping 0.3% per year. Each degree of warming will drop global corn yields by 7%, a process already well underway. This study, you know, he has links to all of his statements he's making here. This study showed a reduction of consumable food calories by 1% per year for the top 10 global crops. If that doesn't sound like a lot, consider that at present outputs, that is around 35 trillion calories each year enough to feed 50 million people with a daily diet of 1,800 calories, which is the UN guideline <clears throat> for avoiding deprivation and undernourishment. If you're reading this, you're likely an educated Westerner of at least middle-class income and largely insulated from system failures that are already occurring now in 2022. You might be reading this and worrying that if the economy collapses, your job, your ability to provide shelter and food for yourself and your family will be threatened. If you are worried about these things, I can say with some certainty that you probably don't live in the Rust Belt you probably don't live in South Africa. You definitely don't live in Venezuela or Sri Lanka. If you did, you would not be worried about it because the process is either well underway or has already happened. The geographic position of your country its level of integration with the global economy and its role within that system, 
net export, import, food security, etc., means the pressures of the coming century are going to affect every single country differently. As a general rule, the more northern the geography, the more insulated its inhabitants will be due to purchasing power differences and the relatively milder climates. As prices of food and goods necessarily rise, developed nations will suffer relatively less decreases in their standards of living. The proportion of their income that the average Westerner spends on their food and energy will substantially increase, but even with these increases, they are still a long way from starvation and will likely be able to remain that way for decades after we see the first societal breakdowns of nations in the global south. Countries in the global south are much more exposed to climate changes in the milder climates of the north and already unable to compete on purchasing power with other countries. Consider for a moment climate change in the Syrian civil war. And this is, uh, you know, one of the pets of the climate change deniers. Whenever they like to poke fun at climate alarmists and doomers in general, what they do is they, they point out laughing that doomers are actually suggesting that the, uh, you know, that the Syrian civil war had anything to do with climate change. So uh, we will see what Adam has to say about that. <clears throat> All right, this is a gross simplification, but from a geopolitical perspective, the Syrian civil war was preceded by a drought, an increase in food prices, and economic migration into the cities as farms failed. The resulting civil unrest calls the government to focus its efforts on maintaining stability within the main urban centers, which led to a reduction in its ability to maintain a security umbrella in the rural regions. The resultant power vacuum meant that insurgents and groups of all kinds were able to seize territory. The Civil War might be the first climate conflict, not in the way that we imagined decades ago, direct wars between states over resources, but instead a slow fracturing of the state as resource shortages and supply limitations drain it of its ability to maintain the monopoly on violence. It is a variation of a pattern that we will likely see repeated all across the world with the failure of each system making the failure of related systems more likely. If conflicts like Syria emerge in other countries, the mass movement of people out of these areas and into others results in a strain on the economies, societies, and governments of neighboring countries as demonstrated by Lebanon. Now, it is seemingly in terminal decline. I think Lebanon is worse off than Syria by this point. Libya and Syria got into a bit of trouble. Yes, I would say they did placing pressure on an already struggling Lebanon, which is now in trouble. Within economics and risk analysis, these are referred to as second order effects, like trying to predict which corner of the room 
the blocks of our falling Jenga tower are going to end up in small changes in initial it inputs lead to enormous differences in second and third order outputs. The second and third order effects are what affect us most directly. Which governments are going to struggle and when? Which economies are going to collapse? Which industries are going to fail? And what new industries might emerge? There are genuinely limitless possible scenarios and answers to these type of questions, even, even further confounded by the fact that dramatically changing circumstances will mean that, that things that today seem unthinkable will in the future seem not just sensible but necessary. For example, coltan, an ore you likely haven't heard of. Well, anyone on this channel has certainly heard of coltan. <clears throat> For example, coltan is necessary to produce a wide range of personal electronic devices, and there are only a handful of places on the planet where it is currently mined. The richest reserves in the world being found in unstable countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rwanda, and Venezuela. Will richer countries provide direct military aid in order to secure the raw materials that they need to keep functioning? It seems unthinkable that they would not. One likely scenario is that this work will not be carried out by sovereign militaries, but instead by arm's length, whatever PMCs are, arm's length PMCs and contractors like the Wagner Group. If this sounds far-fetched, note that Eric Prince, CEO of Blackwater, came close to enacting this exact solution for extracting the trillions of resources buried in Afghanistan during the Trump presidency. So asking our question again, what does collapse look like? It depends on who you are. At a personal level, okay, at a personal level, if you, yeah, if you, anyone listening to Collapse Chronicles, uh huh, if you are a Western billionaire, you likely will not notice any drop in your relative standards, in your relative living standards for decades, possibly even the entire century. If you are a middle class person, located in a mild northern climate, integrated into their local community, living in a country that is or has the ability to be self-sufficient in terms of material and agriculture production, you are likely insulated from the mass starvation and conflict that will emerge in the countries most exposed to climate change, even if supply chain shocks and global decomplexification will mean a noticeable and painful drop in your living standards during your lifetime. Okay? If you are a Congolese child slave being forced to fight and mine coltan for a local warlord, what does the collapse of global supply chains and advanced manufacturing mean for you in practical terms? You might welcome a NATO military intervention. Depending 
on where you are standing, collapse doesn't mean the end. Well, doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean the end. Depending on where you're standing, collapse doesn't mean the end. Uh, and then he got anyway. This is a long involved piece. I'm going to skip over. That he he starts all talking about. Constantinople and Fatahas and Islamic perspectives and Jerusalem and Egypt. Anyway, moving through all that muddled up stuff in the middle. Okay. Our governments and economies, the systems that make up our global civilization are human constructions, but they are not constructed the way we might construct a bridge or a house. They are emergent structure. They are emergent structures with reactive properties molded by the conditions in which they were born and shaped by present material conditions just as much as they control them. As those systems collapse, like in Syria, power does not vanish. It changes shape. It is diffused and then centralized elsewhere as a new system emerges to take its place. This is what collapse will look like, and it is already here. As William Gibson famously said, the future is not evenly distributed. We cannot predict how our Jenga tower is going to fall. The best we can do is position ourselves to avoid the falling blocks and wait until it is over. Then we can collect the bricks build a new structure, and start playing the game again. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of with the guy up to the very last sentence when he blows it with that, uh, with that little uh, blast of hopium uh, out in the middle from nowhere. Obviously, uh, did Adam call himself a, an economist? Obviously, Adam Wren is not an ecologist. Okay, he has a Master's of Arts in Geopolitics, Territory, and Security. So, an MA in Geopolitics. So, that's where he's coming at this. He, he obviously is not, uh, you know, coming at this discussion from a biological, ecological uh, point of view. Uh, you know, the comments uh, from certain individuals, you know, it's going to be hard to pick up the pieces and start a new civilization when, you know, we've become a hothouse earth when uh, the, the biological conditions for uh, the survival uh, of human life and other uh, higher life forms is no longer there. No music on a dead planet, as the t-shirt says. I gotta get that t-shirt. No music on a dead planet. So he's just acting like this is all political. He, he, he's completely ignoring what I call the deep end of the doomsday prophecy pool. Uh, this is a very good analysis of what I call the shallow end of the uh, of the uh, <clears throat> the doomsday prophecy pool. It's a uh, you know if if if. if you didn't have the deep end of the pool, which is the ecological collapse uh, of, of the planet, you know, that underpins 
all of the shallow end of the doomsday prophecy pool. Uh, with no deep end, there's not going to be a shallow end. So as long as the, as the ecosystem holds together, uh, this guy probably has a pretty good grasp of things. But of course, the wild card that he doesn't talk about or doesn't want to think about is the ecological collapse. Uh, and, and, and good luck on uh, playing our silly little uh, human civilization games uh, on, a, uh, on a planet that does not support uh, human life or certainly or does not have the environmental conditions necessary to recreate a global industrial civilization after this one collapses. And uh, that's where I uh, that's where I veer off from Adam Wren. But if you don't pay attention, then of course he never mentions the word nuclear war. A, a geopolitician talking about territory and security, not mentioning nuclear war anywhere, and what will collapse look like? That was a that was that was an interesting uh, little. Uh, Thing to leave out of your analysis, Adam. But anyway, guys, I'm not. I'm not going to knock the guy. That's what we're here uh, doing at Collapse Chronicles. Is this listening to various voices at least having the conversation? Sitting here in the echo chamber of the Doomosphere, I noticed Sandy Shellis was asking on her show, kind of rhetorically, whether I am the one who came up with the term echo chamber of the doomosphere. I, no, I did not come up with the term. I'm just w one of the many examples of the echo chamber of the doomosphere. It was actually uh, my buddy, fellow collapsitarian Mike Sleva, who you don't hear much from anymore, who told me uh, about four years ago when I asked him, you know, what happened to you, dude? And he said, I just got tired of, you know, basically preaching to the choir in the echo chamber of the doomosphere. You know, after saying we are so doomed a hundred thousand times in a hundred thousand different ways, I guess Mike just went on with his life, and uh, with that, I'm going to head on with my life and go back over to Netflix and uh, see what I can find to distract myself from the doom and gloom before I wake up tomorrow morning for my daily digest of doom at medium.com. And I already have one picked out. So tomorrow's Chronicle of the Collapse, unless another one takes its place, will be... Oops, I deleted it. I'm going to have to find it, but I'll find it by a fellow named Mike Myers, I believe. So join us for that. Bye, guys.